hopes for the great things in this world takes pains to attain them. How can my hopes of everlasting life be well ground if I do not strive and labor for that eternal inheritance? Breathe forth love to thee, my God. stolen from our mother country and brought here. We have tilled the ground and made fortunes for thousands, and still they are not weary of our services. I was born in 1760, on February 14th, a slave to Benjamin Chu of Philadelphia. Richard Allen, my great-great-great-great-grandfather, was the founder and first bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And he was sold at the age of seven years to a Stokely Sturgis in Delaware. Slavery is a bitter pill. We would think that our day's work was never done. And thus my troubles were increased and I was often brought to weep. The rest of the family was sold off, and there was never any contact made with the ma major part of his family again. My sins were a heavy burden. I thought hell would be my portion. I cried unto him, and all of a sudden my dungeon shook. My chains flew off, and glory to God, I cried. I was constrained to go from house to house, exhorting my old companions and telling to all what a dear savior I had found. I joined the Methodist Society and met in glass in the forest. The relationship in Delaware, in the, in the forest and on the plantation was really inclusive of all people. There was a welcoming sense of inclusion that uh, allowed both blacks and whites together to experience the religion and the interaction. One of the great things about reading about the story, the life and times of Richard Allen, was that all people were equal under the eyes of God. Methodism had a well-deserved reputation for being open to all people, regardless of color, class, or rank. And this kind of egalitarian attitude drew Allen and others to the Methodist sect. So when Allen met them, uh, it was not uncommon to find a black slave, for example, preaching to white slave owners. Richard Allen has this epiphany when he sees traveling preachers. He says, oh my God, the word of God will let me imagine another world where masters aren't in control of black people's lives and bodies. In addition to working long days, he starts to dedicate long evenings and early mornings to Bible worship. And this is his first foot out the door of slavery. It had often impressed upon my mind that I should one day enjoy my freedom. A door was opened unexpectedly for me to buy my time. My master proposed to me and my brother to buy our freedom. $2,000 continental money.
I came to Philadelphia. Preaching was given out to me at 5 o'clock in the morning at St. George's Church. The Methodist movement in America was growing. The largest population of blacks in America at that time is here in Philadelphia. The numbers of blacks coming into St. George's Church were increasing by leaps and bounds. As Methodism became far more institutional, it seemed that it became less and less racially egalitarian. So it is at this moment that Richard Allen begins to ponder the creation of an African church. Absalom Jones and I discussed feeling cramped, so we saw the necessity of erecting a place of worship for the colored people. We raised a society of 42 members. A free African society. Most people probably thought he was out of his mind. I mean, you know, free. I mean, where, where would you go? The Methodist establishment was threatened by Allen's actions. The elders soon forbid us holding any such meetings. He used very degrading and insulting language to us. So, tensions are building when Richard Allen and Absalom Jones show up to church on a Sunday like they ordinarily would, but the rules have changed all of a sudden. Jones and Allen arrived that Sunday morning and were directed to the balcony. They felt that they were co-owners of this church. They were not going to sit in an all-black section. We had not been long upon our knees before I saw one of the ushers having hold of Reverend Absalom Jones, pulling him up off his knees. The usher persisted and began to forcibly move Absalom Jones. Mr. Jones said, wait until prayer is over and I will get up and trouble you no more. By this time, prayer was over, and we all went out of the church in a body, and they were no more plagued with us in the church. So something very hostile, something very mean-spirited, something very uh, awful happened that day. The walkout was the beginning of the civil rights movement in the United States of America. The black church gave Richard Allen a sense of freedom and autonomy impossible to imagine. We had no place of worship, and we did not mean to go to St. George's Church anymore. Here was the beginning and rise of the first African church in America. In the summer of 1793, yellow fever broke out all over Philadelphia. The mayor of Philadelphia asked Absalom Jones and Richard Allen to help take care of the sick and the dead. Benjamin Rush, who was the leading physician in Philadelphia, wrongly concluded that people of African descent were immune from the effects of the yellow fever and thought that they could help their cause for equality and the creation of an inclusive society by going into the homes of white suffering Philadelphians and nursing those who were sick and burying those who had died. And so we did. Our moral certitude would be on trial and we would prove ourselves the equal. No, the superior of all of our vilifiers. 
They had carts and they were hauling bodies up and down the street and they were calling, bring out your dead. There was just so much devastation and illness around the city and people just didn't know why everyone was dying. Matthew Carey, who was a local publisher, published an account wherein, as part of his story, he accused the nurses of having charged exorbitant rates and also of stealing from some of their patients. Instead of doing what most people would have done, which is simply just shrug their shoulders and say, what can we do? Uh, they did what was unheard of. They sat down and they wrote their own account. He was wrong in giving so partial and injurious an account of the colored nurses. If they have taken advantage of the public distress, is it any more than Mr. Carey hath done of its desire for information? This was the first copyrighted pamphlet published by Africans in America. While others allowed that Matthew Carey could write a one-sided story, Richard Allen understood that if you did not write down your version, then it didn't happen. Is it a greater crime for a black to pilfer than for a white to privateer? Such slanderers as these who propagate such willful lies are dangerous. The striking quality about Alan is that he has an indomitable will and really thinks that he can do anything in life. But the white Methodists force Alan's hand. They claim Bethel Church as their own. They aim to take over the church and install a white elder. Alan won't budge. He leads a resistance and the congregation backs him willingly. A new clergyman was appointed to take the charge in Philadelphia. He soon waked us up by demanding the keys and the books. Unless we submitted to him, he would read us all out of meeting. We told him the house was ours, we had bought it, and paid for it. This brought on a lawsuit, which ended in our favor, delivered by the providence of God and determined by the Supreme Court. The uh, very first sit-in in America was not in the 1950s at a lunch counter, but the first sit-in was actually at Mother Bethel Church. This led directly to the formation of the AME Church, and it became an unprecedented assertion of black self-determination. From Bethel, the church would grow and grow rapidly. The AME Church came to be, as W.E.B. Du Bois described, the greatest Negro organization in the world. Women were always there. Women were with Allen and Jones as they walked out of St. George Methodist Episcopal Church. This was certainly the case for his first wife, Flora, who helped form the Free African Society. When Flora died, Allen married Sarah Bass, who had distinguished herself as a nurse during the yellow fever epidemic. They had six children together. Sarah became very involved in helping Allen build the church. She became the quintessential mother and a role model for other African women. Preaching under the auspices of Bethel and other AME churches was the job of men. Women didn't lead. Darina Lee was a young mother in Allen's congregation. She was sanctified and Inspired by Allen, she felt the calling to preach. There was a lot of opposition to women speaking in Allen's church. Richard Allen said that the Methodist discipline knew nothing about women preachers. So 
Alan is deliberately ambiguous. He never said no. He meant no, but he didn't want the record to reflect no. While there was involvement of women in the life of the church, there was no involvement at the level of ministry and ordination and preaching. Then one day, as a minister at Bethel is preaching, he loses his place. It was at that point that Doreen and Lee, feeling the spirit, preach that text with fervor. And it was in that particular moment of the spirit that Richard Allen recognized and acknowledged that indeed Doreena Lee was called of God to preach. But she continued to receive resistance from some of her brothers, but it did not stop her. Oh, how careful ought we be lest we call into disrepute even the word of life, she warned. Despite many successes, especially in creating an independent black church, Richard Allen confronted many frustrations and disappointments, and he was mad and angry with American society, and he was afraid that many of his hopes, dreams, and aspirations would not be realized. It's, it's not surprising, uh, after all that Allen had gone through uh, in his later years, that he would begin to have doubts about whether or not America could be a place and a home for blacks. Richard Allen and his colleagues began to explore options for a free black colony, either in Haiti or in Africa or perhaps even in Canada. They were serious, but at the same time, a group of whites formed the American Colonization Society. From the outset, the American Colonization Society was a front to send all free blacks out of American society. They never intended to send slaves to Africa. Richard Allen still believed that the idea of some African Americans immigrating outside of the United States was worthy of discussion. There was a meeting held at Mother Bethel in 1817 where the leadership in the black community called together a mass meeting of black Philadelphians to discuss colonization. When all of the discussion had ended and the meeting was coming to its conclusion, it was clear that the movement was not going to find favor. Richard Allen was an intelligent man. He was a fearless man. Everything that he did was helping us prepare for the future. By the end of his life, through the ups and through the downs, Alan became really committed to staying in America and making things work. And uh, it's amazing because when he died 1831, there really weren't many signs that uh, were hopeful that um, things would ever get better for the majority of blacks in America. And yet, uh, he died at peace, that this was home. This land which we have watered with our tears and our blood is now our mother country and we are well satisfied to stay. Here, wisdom abounds, and the gospel is free.